Open with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5. How many people know who wrote the book of Romans? Huh? There, okay, okay, good. Yeah, it wasn't a trick question. Somebody looked at me like, ooh, setting me up. No, yeah, Paul wrote it. Paul wrote the book of Romans. Did he write any other books? Quite a few, yes. Again, not another trick question. Most of the New Testament actually was written by Paul. And what we know, there's a particular thing that Paul wrote about. Two, two very important things that Paul wrote about in all of his epistles. And it's kind of what we're talking about tonight, that the first point is in Christ. That this is Paul's theology is that we are in Christ through our salvation has placed us in Christ and nothing can take us from there. Nothing can move us from that position. And, uh, it was done by him. First Corinthians 1 30 says, of him are we in Christ. Okay. Uh, and the second point that he spoke about is the body of Christ, the church. And he, he is the one who taught us what the church is. Christ hinted at it, and he said it's coming, but he didn't define it because how could we know? But Paul is the one who defined the church, and he is the one who uses the phrase the body of Christ to describe the church. Okay, so here, Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Lord, bless this uh, time in your word, and uh, lead us through it in your name. Amen. Uh, we're going to talk, we started last week talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and we'll continue that. Tonight, without actually getting to any of the gifts, we're not, we'll get there. We will, I promise. But again, I just want to, uh, continue to lay the foundation and the context for the gifts of the Spirit. Like anything in the Bible, none of it is in, just comes out of nowhere, right? None of this teaching is in a vacuum in the sense that Paul doesn't just say, hey, how about the gifts of the Spirit? Let's talk about that. But he builds up to it, and then after he he talks about them, he is he is uh, talking about how they operate or how we operate in them. So they are a big part of uh, our life as believers. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit are an important part of the church, like we talked about last week. That the church is a gifted church because we are here for a purpose to reveal Christ, and how can we do that unless He gives us the gifts necessary. Uh, but I just want to look tonight, we'll actually look in three different places. There's Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4. And these three chapters are where Paul uh, lays out the gifts of the Spirit. But I want to look a little bit. It's kind of a study, okay? So we're going to look a little bit before and after. We're not going to so much look at the gifts. We'll get there. But we want to look, what is he talking about before he talks about the gifts? And then what is he talking about after he talks about the gifts? So here in Romans chapter 12, we see that before he talks about the gifts, he talks about the presenting of our bodies. We love these verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Isn't that an interesting idea? We are a living sacrifice. The sacrificial system in the Old Testament was bloody and there was death and it was put on the altar and it was burned, it was consumed and it went up as a sweet smelling savor. But Paul here is talking about us as believers 
that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, that my life speaks and the way I operate, the way I communicate, the way I live my life is a testimony to what I believe. Isn't that what we, isn't that what we like to see in our kids? Like we want to see, uh, that their actions aren't just outward obedience, right? I'm, it's there, of course. I'm not going to do this because I'll get caught. But we want, we want it to be like the result of an inward character that we have raised our kids and we have taught them and given them a foundation not just to have but to live off of so that when people see their life they say wow that is a result of something that it's not just an outward action but it is the inward life working out and as believers that's what we hope for isn't it that's what i hope for in my own life that Uh, I wouldn't just be doing things in my life, but I would be led by something and I would be guided by something and it would be an inward structure uh, that is that is Christ. Okay, so present your bodies a living sacrifice that you understand that when you go out to the grocery store, that you are different that you're not just going to the grocery store, you're not just getting uh, whatever pound of baloney but you are going there and you are a witness to something and that you are bringing with you a message that can impact people and you have the ability to love people we drove up from baltimore last week and we had fun at the rest stops just talking to the guys uh, you dug a guy at dunkin donuts you know i don't know just trying to stir up some kind of gospel act some kind of uh, conversation, right? And it's, that's what we are. We are a living sacrifice. And we are going and our lives are not our own, but our lives are given to God and maybe He could use us. Imagine that. Ooh, terrifying. That's terrifying. Verse two. Do not be conformed to this world. And that's like what we were saying. The confirmation or the conformity is like an outward outward representation it's like what can i stick on me that makes me look good right or what can i put on my exterior that would make me fit in or it would make me accepted right how do i need to wear my hair or how do i you know how do i look in order to be part of the crew what do i need to drive what do i need to talk like how how is it right what do i need to do Paul is saying, don't get wrapped up in outward conformity to things. And especially don't be conformed to an outward conformity that is to the world system. Because it is always changing. And it doesn't care about you at all. And it is, uh, it is coming from somewhere. From the father of lies. And he wants to destroy. But instead, be transformed. But instead, be transformed where there would be uh, that you would be changed on the outside because of what is happening on the inside. That my life is different. Why? Because I got in trouble. Have you anybody ever get in trouble in high school? And what do you have? You go to your parents. I will never, never do that again. Right. I will conform to everything that you want from me. And then as soon as you walk away from the conversation, you're trying to figure out in your mind, okay, how can I get away with this without them knowing, right? Like there is an outward conformity, and I'll say anything that you need me to say so we can end the conversation and I can be about my business. But instead, God is calling us to be transformed inwardly. He's not interested in us coming to him and saying, okay, God, what do you need me to do? What do you need me to do so I so that you'll know I'm serious about you? He's like, ah, there's nothing, there's nothing there. Read Isaiah chapter 1. He says, I don't want anything that is coming from the outside, but I am looking to ha- have a difference made deep inside of you. Uh, Psalm 15, 6, he looks for truth in the inward parts, and that in me, in the deepest part of me, I would be changed by the work of God. My salvation is what kicks this off. 
that I am a new creation. I have a new, there are new, I'm regenerated. I'm a new creature. Wow, imagine that. And then that would be developed and I would feed that reality and then it would work its way out of me. And slowly, maybe, maybe for you it was quickly you're changed. Maybe that some actions on the outside are quickly changed by the gospel. But other things, it takes time for the transformation to be happening. The renewal, I mean, like the renovation. Peter was just telling me he's renovating the bathroom. And everything he takes apart is more things to take apart. Right? And there's more work. And it's just an ever... Like, are we the same way? That the Holy Spirit is working on us and He is renovating us and renewing us in our thinking. And as we go, the more we walk with God, the more we understand we need Him. Isn't that interesting? That when I'm saved, I think, oh my gosh, I'm saved. That's amazing. But then I walk with God and I say, oh my gosh, I still need, I need ex- to be saved experientially. I need salvation every day. That I need to be reflecting on what he's doing and what he has done and what he will do. That it's important and that I grow. And I grow. I am being transformed. And it happens by his renewing my mind. Renewing my mind. What a great idea. Negative thinking. Right? Uh, how does that work? I mean, it's every one of us deals with it, right? Uh, self-image. How do we think about ourselves? How do we think about others? How do we think about God? Like these things need to be changed. And the Holy Spirit is faithful to come and to do that work in me. And the Word of God comes and it literally, literally physically changes the construct of my mind. Now, this is more than just an allegory. Like, it's not like, oh, you need to change your mind like, you know, no, you need your mind changed. You need to be rewired. Uh, that you are, your brain is made to be changed. It's, it's pliable, malleable. It's not hardwired. There is a, there is an idea that our brains are hardwired and we're just dealt the cards that we have and we got to deal with it. But the truth is that our brains are, are, um, like Play-Doh, right? Like a tiny, tiny ball of Play-Doh. No, like Play-Doh. And they they can be, they can be molded and affected by other things. And I have the liberty as a believer to submit my mind to whatever influence is there. And what Paul is saying here in these first two verses is submit it to the work of the Holy Spirit and allow Him to change you and watch the things that happen in your thinking and in your attitudes. And then verse 3, I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You remember the song years ago by Al LeBlanc? It's, I'm the man. That's the song. I'm the man. 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 What a humble song. Wow. Paul is saying there's no place for that, actually. And if you want to think that way, you can. You're free to. But Paul is saying, how about we think differently? We think soberly. And we have humility in our life. And uh, I love Pastor Stephen's definition of humility. He says, I don't think too highly of myself. But that's not meaning that I think lowly of myself either. It's just that self is not so much in the picture. Humility. That I consider myself, like Paul says here in verse 3, not in the context of me or you in comparison, but I think of myself in the context of God. And that is what the fear of the Lord is. That I understand who I am in relation to God, and that is a very humbling thing. That I understand that I, I am not like up here. <laughs> I cannot save myself. I cannot do this. I cannot fight hard enough. But also, I am not so lost because I have Christ. Naturally, we get to this place where we say, okay, and we talked about this recently, comparative, comparative righteousness, right? Or I say, well, I'm not as good as that guy, but at least I'm not as bad as Brian. 
Right? And as long as I stay a step ahead of Brian, I'll feel good about myself. I'll be okay. Right? What's the problem with that? I look down at Brian and say, ha, 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 ha. Right? But also, I look up at Chris and I say, oh, man, I'll never be Chris right. Oh. Right? What does that do for me? What am I going to gravitate to? I'm going to, I'm going to look at Brian more. It'll make me feel better. Right? But is that humility? Ultimately, it's pride, isn't it? But what Paul is saying here, but think of yourself soberly and think of yourself in the context of who God is and you'll be humbled. But then also think of yourself as the one who, who Christ came to save and it brings us up out of the pit. So this is, this is us. This is us. That's the introduction to the fruits, to the, to the gifts of the Spirit. Isn't that something? Like the fruits of the Spirit aren't just like, okay, here, boom. All right. Here they are. Miracles, faith, administration, preaching, teaching, leadership. Here's the gifts. Boom. And you all of a sudden you have this big burden. You're like, okay, what do I do with it? But instead, there is this teaching that we are, our lives are presented to God as a living sacrifice. In a sense, my life is not my own. And that I am free to communicate the Word of God. And also, I am, I am in a place of humility where I am not the, I am not the point. It's not about me. But it's also not about, uh, how bad I am. It's about how great God is. And there, I find gifts given to me by the Holy Spirit. Not to operate on my own, like we'll see in Ephesians 4, but to bring to the body of Christ, to encourage the body of Christ, to build the body of Christ, and to provoke each other to faith. But then, let's look immediately after. Okay, Then he goes on from verse uh, 6, 7, and 8. He talks about the gifts, and we'll talk about them later. But then look at verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation in the King James. But here it says, let love be without hypocrisy. Arbor that which is evil, evil and cling to that which is good. Let love be, first of all, let love be, but let it be without hypocrisy. How many people like hypocrites? Oh yeah, no, none of us. Okay, so we get that. But you know what it means here? Like it means don't don't uh don't express love like a bad actor. That's what it means. Have you ever watched good acting? You watch good a good good acting, you feel like you're in the scene, you feel like you're part of it, it's like a real thing. But then you watch bad acting. Like when I was in the Christmas play and I had to say a line and it's just terrible, right? And you say that is so unpersuasive, right? I, I, I am so dissuaded by that presentation of whatever that attempt was that the whole thing's invalid. Right? Imagine love being that way. Bad actors. Bad representations. And we see that in the world. We see a bad representation of love, don't we? I'll love you if. Right? If you leave me, then I will. Right? But I love you. But if you leave me, I'll, you know, like it's manipulative and it's a bad representation of love. That's not agape love. And Paul is saying, now he's speaking to the church and he's saying to the church, don't let there be a bad act in the church of what love is. Hey, don't come in here without your body presented to God and try to love people because you will miss the point. You will not love Brian because he's lower than you and you will not love Chris because he's better than you you'll be you'll be proud towards him and and uh and uh what's the other word i don't know bitter towards the other yeah there it is and you'll be bitter towards him right chris is like please stop using me as an example elevated example <laughs> okay victoria there we go that fits no. um but love, love, it, it doesn't look, it doesn't measure and it's not comparative. Let love be without dissimulation. Let it be a true expression of the work of God in your life. 
And then if, as it is, you will find yourself operating in a gift that the Holy Spirit has given you. And you will be, and people will be loved. And you'll say, whoa, whoa, what happened? What did I do? But it'll be that you are in humility letting God work through you. And it's beautiful. And this is, I mean, maybe, you know, we read it and we see, have you ever watched a tutorial video? Like how to install something? And the guy's in like a perfectly level, perfectly square. Everything is ideal. If it's a car part, the engine is perfectly spotless. Everything's labeled. The nuts aren't like seized together and all that kind of stuff, right? Or if I remember doing some training when I worked for a renovation company and we would go to Kohler and they would do these presentations of the new products. And I was laughing because everything is like so sterile and perfect, right? And there's nothing wrong and everything is easy. Everything's like waist level. You don't have to move and everything's perfect. It's just that easy. That's all you have to do, right? And then you, oh, that's going to be so easy. I just watched a YouTube video. I'm ready to do this. And then you get into it in your house and everything's crooked. You know, nothing's, everything's half broken. You, oh my goodness, right? Oh my goodness. Why did I say that? I got a little into the illustration. I forgot what I was illustrating. (laughs) Oh, mercy. Um, the church. Okay. Paul is talking about the church. And trust me, he's not saying this as like a cola representative on YouTube. He, of all people, knows the reality of things when you get into it. Read his experiences in the book of Acts. Read his life in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's brutal. Or 2 Corinthians 11. He knows that life is messy, but he also knows that there is an effective power of God in our lives to transform us and to deal with all the inconsistencies and all the stubbornnesses and all the problems that might arise. And that's why he says in Romans 12, which is the most practical chapter in the Bible, if you want to talk about church life, so practical. He is saying, yes, this works. Love works. Humility works. The fruit of the Spirit builds people. I mean, sorry, the gifts of the Spirit build the body of Christ. It does. And get yourself out of the picture because this is about God. And when we come into the church, we like to leave ourselves out of the picture. Maybe we can put a like a bucket at the door, at the door, and just a big 55 gallon drum that just says "I," right? Just leave "I," "I," right? That big word "I." Leave it here. You're walking into the body of Christ where it is not individualistic. It is the body and we are one in Christ. That's a good idea. I think we'll get some of those, right? Just get some buckets. Just leave I. Just dump self. Huh? You got a couple buckets for me, Chris? 100 gallons. We need 100 gallons just for Chris. Amen. <laughs> we do, we leave it and we come in. And that's what Paul is saying. He says then, like, love will be without hypocrisy. Because I have taken myself out and I am not looking up, I am not looking down, but we are, uh, we are on the same place in Christ. Because if you talk about the gifts, Paul does say, uh, like, go for the, the best gifts, he says in 1 Corinthians 12. Could this produce jealousy? Like, ooh, I wish I had that gift. Ooh, man, I wish I had a gift like Sal, like I could sing. Man, I wish I had the gift of patience like Carlos. Man, uh, oh. No, we rejoice. Paul goes on, Romans 12, he talks about it, right? We rejoice when people rejoice. We are sorrow when people are sorrow. This is the body of Christ. We are one in Him. Okay, now turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12, and we'll look at the same thing happening here. <clears throat> right before he talks about the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about Communion in 1 Corinthians 11. He's talking about the Lord's Supper, right? And he's talking actually in the, in the church at Corinth, uh, communion had turned into quite the party. And people were showing up and they were, they were getting drunk and they were, uh, you know, kind of being gluttonous and it turned into a whole scene. And Paul is saying, what the heck is going on? What is the whole point of this, this feast? The whole point of it is that we would celebrate what? The death of Christ. He says it there in first verse uh, chapter 11 verse 24. 
When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then of the cup, he says, This is the cup of my new co- of, in the new covenant, my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. What is the point of communion? We do it once a month here at Greater Grace. What is the point? The point is to remember the cross. Remember the body that was broken. Remember the body that bore my sins. He took my sins on His body. What an amazing thing. And He poured out His blood for me. He shed His blood for me, washing away my sins and establishing a new covenant in His name. This is the introduction to the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. What a, what a powerful thing. Remember the cross. Remember your salvation. This is the context of the church. We are here because Christ went to the cross. And we are here to communicate the truth that Christ went to the cross. And the gifts are given to the church so that that gospel is presented accurately and it is uh, lifting up Christ. But then after the gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, what do we find? What comes after 1 Corinthians 12? Boom. Thank you. Not a trick question. 1 Corinthians 13, which is what? The greatest definition of love that you will find. And Paul says, okay, I'll show you at the end of verse chapter 31. Tw- at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, he says, I show you a more excellent way. More excellent than what? More excellent than all the gifts. If you, you could be, the church at Corinth was very gifted. They had all the gifts. They had all of the abilities. But there is something better than all of those, and that is the love of God operating in the body of Christ. A more excellent way. So 1 Corinthians 13 goes right into it. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. What good is that? It's it's good for discord. It's good for annoyance. Cymbals. Just out of the blue. Out of rhythm with everything else. And he says, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. Love is the more excellent way. Love without hypocrisy. Love not presented as a bad act, but love expressed through God, which is the purest form, agape love, and all the other loves are fulfilled in the love of God. Okay. Now turn with me quick to Ephesians chapter 4. We see the gifts are communicated here in Ephesians 4. Verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. Does that sound familiar? For Romans 12.1. I beseech you. All right. It's the same. And it literally means I beg you. I am begging you. Please. Please, to walk worthy of the calling which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, bearing one another with love. Hmm. This is before he talks about the gifts. That we would, uh, lowliness, again, humility, not, not regarding self, but regarding others, actually, higher than I regard myself. Gentleness. That's a good word, isn't it? Depending on the relationship, gentleness could mean different things. Right? <laughs> I just think of my two kids. Gentleness with Riley is very different than gentleness with Noah. Right? Gentleness with Noah is like rough with Riley. Right? They are different. They need, you know, they, okay. Um, but in the body of Christ, we have, there's gentleness in our communication. Long-suffering, patience, bearing one another in love. Uh, that it's not a short fuse. That we are able to love each other. And there could be 
disagreements. There could, like we saw last week, there's differences, but, but we bear one another in love. And those, those things don't become center stage. But in, instead, Christ becomes the center and the differences can be dealt with. And I'm not saying that things are just put away and swept under the rug, although, you know, maybe that's what we would like to do with them, just ignore them until they go away. Is that anybody's approach towards uh, cars? Right? Cars making a funny noise. If I ignore it, it'll go away. Right? Yeah, I've tried that. It costs more money that way. And likewise with relationships and with people, when you try to just ignore it and it'll go away, it doesn't. It gets worse, I've found. Yeah. So we bear one another in love and we are patient and long-suffering, but also we are able to deal with things. Verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring. We are working to keep the peace the, the, or the unity. Uh, not, it doesn't say there, endeavor to produce unity. It actually, between me and you as believers, I don't need to produce unity. It is there. Why? Because we are baptized into one body by one Spirit. That the unity that we have is not based on us and what we can produce. In that production, there could be hypocrisy. And in that production, there could be a scale where I look up and down at people. But instead, I recognize the unity that has been established by the Holy Spirit. And that is that we are one in Christ. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. How many times does he say one there? I can't count that high. No, he says it quite a bit. And he's making a point that we there is one salvation, there is one God, and we are in one body, and we uh, that is the grounds for unity and that is the grounds for love. And then he goes into the gifts. But then afterwards, he talks about the new man. And he talks about living in the new man. Look, verse 17, Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Okay, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness and to work all uncleanliness and greediness. But you, but you, oh, you're different. There is a definition of lost right there, isn't there? Oh, man, it sounds like a rough situation to be in. Past feeling, given over to lewdness. But you have not so learned Christ. If you indeed have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Where does that where do we find that? Romans twelve two, right? Be renewed. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So, what the point is, what is the point? Or as we talk about the gifts of the Spirit and that the church is gifted to function the way that God has called it to, and none of us are perfect, nobody's perfect at it, but the gifts are given in this context, that the gifts are not applied to the natural man. We put off the old man and we put on the new man who's created in righteousness and holiness. And the gifts are not applied by carnal means they're not natural but it is the work of god in me that is transforming me and producing something inside of me that is coming out of me and that i find myself able to love able to be gentle able to be patient able to be kind there's a great verse in i think it's uh it's right here ephesians 4:32 get this how about this verse be kind to one another oh that's like kindergarten isn't it Hey, be nice. Hey, be kind to one another. I mean, that's like as soon as babies can move, we're telling them to be kind one to another. Really. 
I keep pulling hair. That's why I don't have hair. Because Noah pulled it all out. No. Like, be kind. Be nice. That's not nice. Hey, hey, hey. Be kind. And Paul here is talking to the the adult believers and in the church context, in the body of Christ. He's saying, you know what? Just be kind to one another. And we could say, I don't know how to be kind. I don't, I can't do that. I look at people and I just want to be mean. That's fine, Paul says. I understand that. He's not saying be kind to one another like you're watching a YouTube tutorial on how to do something in a perfect environment. He is saying be kind to one another in, in the context of the church of Ephesus, the church of Corinth, and the church of Rome. And if you look into the history of these places, they were a mess. Especially the church of Corinth. He's talking to them about love and about functioning together in unity. And he's talking to them about the gifts of the Spirit. But they are a mess. You got a guy sleeping with his dad's wife and it's not his mom. You can figure that out yourself. Right? You got people who are uh, temple prostitutes and they're trying to bring that kind of stuff into the body of Christ. You got people who are offended by meat who are not offended by certain kinds of food. And you have all kinds of differences. In Ephesus, you have them doing different things also. And Paul is saying to them, love one another, be kind to one another. Not in like a play, like a visit, like, you know, I think you get the idea, right? Like he's not saying it in a perfect sterile environment where nothing's wrong and it's easy to do it. Like we are with everybody that you like and everybody that you agree with. And he says, be kind. And you're like, oh, no problem. But he's talking about it in a group of people who come from every different direction, every different foundation of thinking. And he's saying all of those foundations of thinking, we can leave outside the doors and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then in that we love each other and we are kind to one another, long suffering, patient and see what kind of activity will that produce in the church. And in that context and in that environment, the gifts of the spirit are given and they are operating, and they are functioning, and they are bringing us together, knitting us together, and encouraging us, and building us, and motivating us, and moving us out in mission. So, um, the point, I guess, is that the gifts are not given to me as a person. They are. I have gifts. You, We all have gifts. Everybody has one gift, at least. But they are not given to me to be me. Like I put on my business card, right? Pastor GGCF and, you know, this, and then a list of my gifts. And if you need my gifts at any time, call me. That's not it. But they are given by God to the church. To individuals, but the individual is part of the body. They are given to the church for the encouragement. And he uses them as he will. That's a good one. And we'll get into that as we talk about and we define these gifts a little more. That I find it funny sometimes that these gifts are scheduled into the into the program. Like, have you ever seen a a a, a, a worship playlist and there's scheduled into it spontaneous worship? <laughs> Five minutes of spontaneous worship. Right? I get it. I get it. I get it. But it's funny. Right? It's funny. Likewise, with the gifts, I don't take the gifts and say, okay, it's time to turn this one on like I have a switchboard and say, okay, gifts of healing, boom, all right? Gift of compassion, no, I'll take that one off. No, it's not that, but it's the that if I am operating in the Holy Spirit, then he is free to use me and the gifts will be, he will use me to express him. And that's why the gifts are given. So, um, it's a great thing. We need it. The church needs the gifts. And honestly, we could be, um, we could be so concerned about it, right? And like, so, like, we don't want anything to get out of control. And we say, we don't recognize the gifts. We say, this is, we, we, we everything's buttoned up, it's clean, and we'll just, you know, we'll be boring here together. No. Uh, but also, it's not just, woo! It's not just like wild, but it is, the expression of God in the body of Christ. And I love it. I love it. Sometimes there's joy like unspeakable. Uh, we were in, Pastor Doug and I were talking last night, a uh, convention in Baltimore years ago, uh, maybe in 2005 or something like that. There was a um, service ended and they sang a song. 
and like the entire room was changed. And I, I, it was something. It was an expression of God. And three hours we sat there and sang the same song. People were standing on chairs and waving flags and there was just a joy and there was a reality of the presence of God that overwhelmed us. And it was, it was beautiful. But the next night we were laughing because the next night they started, they sang the same song. It's like, let's do it again. Yeah, let's do it. That was awesome. And then we sang the song and everyone was like, all right, let's go get a hot dog. Right? Like it just wasn't there. And that's okay. That's okay. God gives it severally as He will. And that's the beauty of it. What is our role? To be presented to Him as a living sacrifice and to be uh, loving each other and understanding each other, not on this scale, but as one in Christ. And then He is free to, to work in that. And that's, that's all we can do. And we, we understand it. And when we, when it's happening, I'm not saying we're foolish, but when it's happening, we understand it and we, we allow God to do it. But, um, there's a beauty in it and it, the context of it. So you see in each chapter where it's defined, you see that it's, it's surrounded by humility, by love, by grace, by care, by kindness, and by understanding of the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for uh, giving us gifts, Lord. And uh, thank you for your expression in the body of Christ. And I uh, thank you for everyone who came out tonight. Lord, we're so happy to be here together in your name. And uh, pray for anybody who got stuck in the rain on their way here. You would keep them safe and get them home safe, Lord. And uh, Lord, we we want to be used by you. Help us to understand our salvation. Humble us under your mighty hand, Lord. Lead us in kindness. Lead us in love. Lead us in patience, Lord. In your name, amen.